Hello. This video lecture talks about heritage and memory from early 16th century until today. It summarizes major trends in how societies in Europe have dealt with the past. The video lecture is based on the chapter 7.4, Heritage and Memory, in the handbook called The European Experience, a Multi-Perspective History of Europe, where you can find more details. In the first part, we present examples of how the past was used in the early modern Europe to foster identities and legitimize political and confessional movements. In the second part, we show how relations to the past changed in the 19th century in the wake of nation building and how the modern idea of cultural heritage and its protection was born. Finally, we discuss major trends in how Europeans approached heritage in the 20th century and how they engaged with the difficult recent past. As this lecture will make clear, the past and its material traces, such as monuments, have always served as an important social resource, as an object of interest and admiration, and also as a contested field. It has been used for making or remaking collective identities, for giving legitimacy to new regimes and states, for providing new institutions or practices with an aura of ancientness and authenticity, and even for negotiating current political and social issues or pursuing political goals by referencing back to the past. Yet the ways of using the past have also changed over time. First, they reflected some of the major shifts in European culture and society, such as the rise of historicism in the 19th century or globalization of discourse on heritage in the 20th century. Second, some of the major watersheds and historical experiences have influenced the ways the past has been treated, such as reformation, the French Revolution, large-scale urbanization, or the Second World War. In early modern period, confessional breakup of European society and the formation of proto-national identities were particularly important phenomena, which found echoes in the instrumental uses of the past to give support to new religious movements or churches. One such example was in England and the widely popular Book of Martyrs by John Fox, a piece of religious history which created a sense of continuity between English Protestants and early Christianity, and which provided historical justification for the separation of Anglican Church from Rome and the papacy. In Bohemia, the humanist historians such as Václav Hayek and Jan Bielejowski wrote histories with a clear aim to improve the image of the country that was stigmatized in the eyes of other Europeans as the land of heretics after the Hussite movement of the early 15th century. Their goal was to prove historical continuity of Utraquist religious practices while also linking their country more firmly with the tradition of antiquity, despite the fact that the Czech lands laid beyond the limits of the ancient Roman Empire. Anti-German sentiments were included as well in the narrative and helped foster a sense of ethnic distinctiveness. In the Low Countries, the long-lasting revolt of the Dutch provinces against the Spanish crown was buttressed by creation of the historical myth of origin that linked early modern Dutch people with the Batavians, a nascent Germanic tribe. Historical parallels were made between their fights against the Roman Empire in the first century and the ongoing struggle of the Dutch with Spain. The myth of Batavians as the Dutch ancestors was formulated in historical texts, but also disseminated widely in the public, for instance, via theater plays, 
or paintings. Urban communities too cultivate their memory through history writing. In Upper Lusatia, for instance, a region which is now situated between Germany and Poland, but which was part of the Bohemian crownlands in the 16th century, the important trading cities commissioned historians to write down their urban pasts. Even though these histories often registered routine events, such as floods and fires, still they also provided narratives of long historical continuity. They highlighted major turning points. They explained relations of the city to larger units and monarchs. And that way, they fostered the sense of a distinct identity. The advance of modernity in the 19th century brought new relation to the past, which became seen as distant and foreign, yet also highly interesting and enormously important as a resource for legitimizing many social and political objectives. The new era saw the rise of national heritage, which means the process of appropriation and reinterpretation of artworks and traces from the past as a collective treasure that belongs to the peoples and represents a particular nation. The experience of the French Revolution was seminal here. Destruction of everything that symbolized old regime was soon condemned as an act of vandalism, while the remnants of the past were appropriated as national heritage. Likewise, the lootings of art and monuments during Napoleon's advancement throughout Europe and Northern Africa was soon counterbalanced by the idea that heritage belongs to a particular nation, to a context of its origin, and cannot be uprooted and expatriated. The attention of cultural elites turned to the medieval past and to vernacular traditions finding new interest in remnants of Gothic architecture, Celtic monuments, Nordic sagas, and ancient eposes and legends, some of which were fabricated rather than discovered. These relics were used to construct a sense of connection linking the nationalist movements of the present back to the mythic past. Historians crafted narratives of the national past, constructing sometimes precarious continuities and depicting major national dramas, constituting golden or dark ages in national histories. The birth of national museums, which stored and studied pieces of national heritage, while also creating powerful representations of national history and the homeland, was followed by many more museums, such as museums of cities, regions, decorative arts, or folklore. National memory was also more and more widely disseminated in the public spaces, for instance, through erection of many statues or by street naming. In Barcelona, for instance, plans were made to name streets of the new urban districts in such a way to systematically convey Catalan history. In most cases, however, the memory and its dissemination became a highly contested issue that reflected political and ideological divisions of respective societies. This was the case of instrumental appropriation of the philosopher Voltaire by French Republicans or of Jeanne d'Arc by monarchists and political Catholicism in France. Urbanization, which brought fundamental changes to structural settlements, distribution of population and the ways of life, was a particular threat for the built heritage from old times, especially in the growing and modernizing bigger cities, which became outposts of modernity, unlike many small historical towns that became places of nostalgia. The ruthless rebuilding of historical centers Nevertheless, soon became moderated by early monumental protection measures and legislations, or opposed by nascent heritage protection movement. 
In art history and urbanism, several different approaches emerged to tackle the puzzle of how to reconcile preservation of urban heritage with the desirable urban development, which was represented by figures such as Camilo Cite, John Ruskin, or Evgen Violet Ladic, who is known for his renovation of the old town of Carcassonne or the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. The 20th century in many ways continued trends of the previous century. For instance, recourse to the past and cultivation of national myth remained a powerful tool to create national identities and give legitimacy to many new states that emerged in the 20th century. Yet the century saw many shifts as well. For instance, heritage protection became further institutionalized and bureaucratized. Mass tourism and post-World War II development led to a so-called heritage boom. Growing academic interest in heritage and memory gave birth to new subdisciplines of heritage studies and memory studies. Institutionalization of heritage on the European and international scale was partly stimulated by the damages of cultural property during both world wars. Important in this respect was the foundation of UNESCO, which became a major expert body and coordinating actor in heritage protection worldwide. Heritage also became increasingly expert driven. By the end of the century, however, the postmodern criticism turned at turned attention to Western bias in much of the heritage concepts and practices, while also calling for more participatory approaches, giving thus stronger role to communities as co-curators of heritage. The memory culture of Europe has been profoundly affected by the horrible experiences such as the two world wars and the Holocaust but also with many oppressive regimes. Historical traumas, difficult and divisive past have overshadowed positive stories of European advancement. Still, the process of dealing with the memory of the Second World War and issues such as the complicity with Nazi forces wasn't that easy and straightforward. It took some 20 years when these questions such as the so-called Vichy syndrome, were opened in Western Europe. And it was only with the end of the Cold War division when the simple victim-like version of history was problematized in Eastern Europe. The Cold War division and divergent experiences have also affected the ways memory has been dealt with. For instance, the so-called politics of truth became more typical for the post-socialist countries. In spite of the horrors of wars and many divisive experiences in Europe and among the nations, the late 20th century saw many discussions on how to nurture a common European memory. Rather than creating a new grand narrative, many scholars resorted to grounding the memory on a negative experiences such as the Holocaust or to critical reflection over the so-called European Lie de Memoir or places of memory or to pursuing multi-perspective stories of European development such as the efforts of the House of European History, new museum in Brussels established by the European Parliament. Besides, from 1970s, the concept of European cultural heritage became more and more prominent as the idea of the common heritage became seen as an instrument for building up shared European identity that would support European integration in a more bottom-up and cultural based sense. Many programs such as the European Heritage Days, European Heritage Label or European Capital of Culture were launched in the last few decades with a clear aim to highlight the European dimension in cultural heritage of the continent. 
Thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in the topic, have a look at the full chapter in the handbook or check the online version of the chapter at the Historiana website.